Good morning. I'm Samantha Bricknell, Research Manager at the Australian Institute of Criminology and currently managing the AIC's statistical collections. One of our long-term monitoring programs is the National Homicide Monitoring Program, or NHMP. And today I'm going to dis discuss some of the findings um, from our most recent NHMP re report, which will be released on May the 5th. The NHMP was established in 1990 and uh, collates information on all homicide incidents, victims and offenders recorded by Australian State and Territory Police. An incident is recorded uh, in the NHMP if an offender was charged with murder or manslaughter or where an offender wasn't identified, police have determined that that particular death was a murder or a manslaughter. Before we discuss the findings today, there are a number of acknowledgements I want to make. The NHMP would not be the NHMP without the data that we get from two primary data sources. One of them is homicide data that we receive from Australian State and Territory Police, and they've been doing this for almost 30 years, uh, and we get over 80 variables from State and Territory Police around homicide incidents, victims and offenders, and due acknowledgement must be expressed to police for providing that data on such a long-term basis. And secondly, to the uh, Victorian Department of Justice and Community Safety and through their Ethics Committee, the JHRIC, and also the WACEC, allowing us access to coronial data that's available on the National Coronial Information System. Finally is the acknowledgement that while this presentation today is discussing numbers, rates and trends, we are talking about people. We are talking about people who met a violent death and we are talking about people who for whatever reason decided to take the life of another person. So since the inception of the uh, NHMP, uh, we have collated information on 8,126 homicide incidents, from which 8,674 victims uh, were killed in uh, either a murder or manslaughter event, and 9,175 homicide offenders. Now, around 90% of uh, homicide incidents are solved. Uh, some of them are subsequently solved after we uh, record the data in the NHMP. But for the most part, there's a very good solve um, clearance rate um, in, in Australia. So while we know that there were 9,175 homicide offenders, there are actually more that are out there. But given that, 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 um, that solve status, which is so high, um, it's a pretty good estimate of the number of homicide offenders um, that have offended um, in Australia since 1990. What we see is that homicide is remarkably consistent and certainly some of the patterns we see in Australian homicide are replicated in homicide incidents that occur around the rest of the world. So from those 8,126 homicide incidents, we see these patterns. Most homicides are committed by males. Around 86% of, of homicide offenders are male and around half of these are aged 18 to 34 years. We don't see any difference between males and females in the sort of charge um, that they receive. Around 9 in 10 males and 9 in 10 females are charged with murder and 1 in 10 are charged with manslaughter. Males are also predominantly the victims of homicide. Just under two thirds of homicide victims over the 30 years of homicide data were male and over half of those were aged between 25 and 49 years. However, when we look at different homicide types, we do see a higher victimisation rate with females, which we'll talk about um, in, in, um, in a few minutes. Most incidents involve just one offender and one victim. Around three quarters of homicide incidents since 1989 90 were single victim, single offender incidents. Only 5% of incidents involve multiple victims, which is usually two or three. The largest number of victims killed in a single incident is, of course, uh, 35 um, as a result of the Port Arthur mass shooting. And 8% of incidents involve multiple offenders. Again, it's mostly multiples of two, and multiple offender incidents generally involve acquaintance homicides. And the largest number of offenders committing a single incident um, is 11, which occurred uh, in the 1990s. Less than 1% of any homicide incident involve both multiple, and mul multiple victims and multiple offenders. In most incidents, the victim knows the offender. The offender is an intimate partner, a family member, a friend, an acquaintance, a work colleague, a housemate, a school colleague, or what have you. Stranger homicides are relatively rare. Around one in 10 incidents overall 
uh, occur between two people who had no known relationship between one another, um, however limited that relationship may have been. Most incidents occur at home and usually the victim's home. Around half of homicide incidents take place in the victim's home and around uh, 8 to 10 per cent are in the offender home. The remainder of homicide incidents occur in public locations and surprisingly very public locations. Outside of residential settings, uh, the largest proportion occur out on a street or a footpath or an open area waterway such as a public park and similar. Finally, most homicides are preceded by an argument, a dispute or disagreement. Motive is not easily distilled into a single or identifiable reason or trigger and some have said, can we really know why someone kills another person? And hence, indicators of motives are just that, an indication of what behaviour or intent preceded that homicide. It may be spontaneous, it might have been longer term. So with these common characteristics in mind, let's drill down into what changes we are seeing in homicide and the current picture of homicide victimisation and offending in Australia. Homicide is decreasing in Australia. And that's not unique to, to Australia. We're seeing that across most of the developed world. Homicide incidents totaled around 300 or more in the 1990s, dropping to uh, the low to high and then low 200s in the 2000s and in 2010s. In 2017, 18, which is the most recent data that we have to hand, it de decreased again to 196 incidents, which is the lowest number recorded since 1989-90. And this is a 35 incident drop since the previous year. And these 196 incidents correspond to an incident rate of 0.78 per 100,000, so less than one person per 100,000 are a victim or an incident of homicide in Australia. This decrease, interestingly, is not being paralleled with an increase in attempted murder, which is one of the reasons why we might see homicide on, on the decrease. And there's been a lot of discussion about why homicide might be de decreasing around access to weapons, alcohol and, and drug use, better interventions and preventative responses in place. What's really interesting, uh, Don Weatherburn, the previous director of the New South Wales um, Boxer, did say in an interview last year that the one conundrum that he's still trying to, to sort out is why homicide is on the decrease and could someone get back to him and, and explain to him why. So it's, it's still one of those question marks about um, why homicide is decreasing, decreasing, but of course it's a good news story that, that it is. So here we can see um, that the, um, from this slide um, the drop um, in incident rates um, and as said um, we have the lowest incident rate on record since 1989-90 which is 0.78 per 100,000. And this compares uh, the incident rate um, with trends in victimisation rates and there's been a lot of discussion about whether we're seeing increases or de decreases in male and female victimisation rate from homicide. This shows that both male victimisation and uh, female victimisation has decreased in line, obviously, uh, with a decrease in the incident rates of homicide. Male victimisation rates are generally double those of females, and this ratio has generally remained consistent uh, over the 29 years of the NHMP data that are presented here. And since 1989-90, the male victimisation rate decreased by 17%, and the female victimisation rate decreased by 27%. So to what extent is homicide driven by the incidence of different homicide types? So in the NHMP, we define three types of homicide or homicide classifications. The first is domestic, which includes intimate partner homicide, which is the leading uh, uh, cause of domestic homicide. Filicides, which is the killing of a child, a biological child, a non-custodial child or a stepchild. Parasites, which is the killing of a parent. Siblicides, the killing of one sister or brother and other family. And that includes kin family relationships among Aboriginal, Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander persons. Then we have the acquaintance homicide classification, which is quite a large category. It involves any relationship between the victim and offender, which is not family related, and where there is a known relationship uh, between the victim and offender. So this is friends, acquaintances, work colleagues, housemates, school friends, gang members, um, someone you might buy your coffee from and talk to on, on, a, on a regular basis. <laughs> 
And then we have stranger homicides where there is no known relationship, however limited, between the victim and offender. Now each year we do have homicide incidents where we don't know the, the relationship between the victim and the offender. These are largely uh, those homicides which are not solved, so an offender hasn't been identified and so we can't, and the police can't record um, what that victim-offender relationship is. But there are some where we just don't know what that victim and offender relationship is um, and that can make up between 10 and 15% of homicides um, from year to year. So as we can see um, from this figure, um, that domestic and acquaintance homicides make up a larger proportion of homicide incidents in Australia and both are on the decrease um, and they are largely driving uh, this decrease in homicide incidents. Acquaintance homicides have been falling steadily since 1989-90 with an overall decrease of 52% from 1989-90 down to 2017-18. Rates of domestic homicide have become a mu much more punctuated, as you can see, and these are largely driven by spikes in intimate partner homicide and, to a lesser extent, filicide. However, drop in the mid-2000s uh, in, domestic in domestic homicide was followed by a sustained rate in this particular um, form of homicide at around 0 0.40 per 100,000. And this is quite interesting because this is driven by the intimate partner homicide rate, which we'll see in the next sl slide, um, and actually um, parallels some of the changes we're seeing internationally around domestic homicide and intimate partner homicide. But overall, the rate of domestic homicide has also dropped by half, like acquaintance homicides, 55% uh, uh, between 1989-90 and 2017 18 As mentioned before, stranger homicide is a relatively rare uh, phenomenon in, in, in Australia um, and has sat around 0 0.10 to 0 0.20 uh, per 100,000 um, across the 29 year period. And there hasn't been really any obvious pattern in stranger homicides in Australia or decline as we have seen for acquaintance and domestic homicides. In Australia, there has been considerable focus on family and domestic violence and domestic homicide, and in particular, intimate partner homicide. Around one quarter of homicides and around 60% of domestic homicides are intimate partner homicides. And most of these are male per perpetrator homicide of a female intimate partner. Around 74% of all intimate homicide, partner homicides since 1989 are the male offender killing his female uh, intimate partner. A fifth are the female perpetrated homicide of a male intimate partner and much smaller numbers as same-sex intimate partner homicides. Around 4% are where a male has killed his male intimate partner and less than 1% are where a female has killed her female intimate partner. And with a focus on intimate partner homicide, uh, there has been a lot of discussion about whether it is declining and there have been a range of data sources and information sources that have been trying to get a sense of whether it is on, on the decrease or on the increase. This figure shows that both female and male victimisation rates um, from intimate partner homicide have largely declined. They are not disaggregated by the offended gen gender, um, but you'll remember that most female victims of intimate partner homicide are killed by um, their male partner and most male victims of intimate partner homicide are killed by their female partner. Female victimisation from intimate partner homicide has fluctuated over the years since 1989-90, but the overall trend is that it has decreased. In the 1990s, the rate was between about uh, 0.70 to over 1 per 100,000, but by the 2010s, it had dropped to around 0.40 to 0.50 per 100,000. The rate of 0.33 per 100,000 in 2017-18 is the lowest rate recorded since 1989-90. What we have seen internationally is a decrease in female victimisation of intimate partner homicide as well. And again, what's really interesting, which reflects that change in domestic homicide and intimate partner homicide, is this drop-off in the mid-2000s, which has effectively steadied um, in that period.
and there'll be a lot of uh, focus on, on, on why that, that has occurred, particularly with all the intervention preventive action that has occurred um, with, with the national action plans and similar focus on trying to, to stem family domestic violence in Australia. With regard to the male victimisation rate, it is half or less than half of the female victimisation rate in Australia and has followed a, a fairly consistent pattern over the last 29 years. While there has been a little bit of a drop off, it's not as sustained um, as the female victimisation rate. So with these trends in place, let's look at the homicide picture for 2017-18. We had 196 homicide incidents um, over that 12-month that period. And of these, around 172 were cleared by police. And in most of those cleared incidents, uh, offender was charged by police. The majority of which, 142, were charged with murder and 20 offenders were charged with manslaughter. In eight uh, incidents, the offender suicide uh, before, the, they, before they were charged and then we had two incidents where they were cleared by other means. What's really interesting when we look at offenders who suicide, um, and, uh, and I should have mentioned when we were talking about the intimate partner homicide, um, that the AIC has just partnered with ANROS looking at pathways to intimate partner homicide by where a, um, a, a male partner has killed his female intimate partner, um, is that a larger proportion of incidents where offender suicide is, intimate, is, is associated with intimate partner homicide. So we are seeing a, a real relationship between uh, that or um, where, where a parent has killed their child. Um, in 17-18, uh, from those 196 incidents, we had 202 victims, uh, 13 of which were children aged between 0 and 17 years, and 185 were adult victims 18 years and older. And we had 213 offenders um, that were identified by police over that 12 month period. Um, we also know, um, and which I'm, um, I'm not going to talk about um, uh, weapon use necessarily um, in, in this presentation, um, but we also know, which is also a, a, a pattern that we're seeing in homicide more generally, um, is the uh, larger proportion of homicides that are being perpetrated by knives and sharp instruments and to a lesser extent um, by firearms, um, personal weapons, which are hands and feet, and blunt instruments. And there's been a lot of focus on, on firearms and firearm violence, um, but in 2017-18, uh, firearms, uh, firearm homicide incident rate was 0.09 per 100,000, again, the lowest on record since 1989-90. Of those 196 homicide incidents, 75 were domestic, 69 were acquaintance, and 25 were stranger homicide. The homicide classification was not known for the majority of the incidents, largely because an offender had not been identified by the police at the time that the data were provided to the AIC. Uh, from this slide, we can look at the incident rate across the jurisdictions. Uh, it is uh, a little bit variable when we look at some of the smaller jurisdictions where rates can be amplified uh, somewhat. Northern Territory um, is a case in point. Um, but if we look at the larger jurisdictions, we can see that there is a predominance of um, intimate partner, sorry, domestic or um, acquaintance homicide across the states and territories. Um, in New South Wales and in Queensland, uh, domestic and acquaintance homicides were, were equivalent. Um, in Victoria, we had a larger rate of acquaintance homicide versus domestic homicide. Uh, in Western Australia, it was a domestic homicide rate um, that was the predominant um, homicide classification or type that, that was occurring in, in that jurisdiction. If we look across the years, these patterns are reasonably consistent. Again, with the smaller jurisdictions, they do change up because we have a much smaller number of incidents. Um, so we'll see in Tasmania, last year there were no domestic homicides, whereas in previous years we may have one up to five domestic homicides occurring. So always it's good to look at the larger jurisdictions, um, and when we look at smaller jurisdictions, knowing that those, those patterns will change from, from year to year. This slide is looking at, um, uh, and we get a lot of questions around uh, male on male, male on female, female on female, and um, female on male incidents, and how they, um, they, they um, pattern across the different homicide type, types. So as I mentioned, males are predominantly offenders in homicide, and they're predominantly victims in homicide. And male on male incidents is the predominant mode of homicide in Australia. 
55% of incidents in 1718 involved a male victim and a male primary offender. And this is largely male-on-male -male acquaintance homicide and male-on-male -male stranger homicides. Male-on-male -male acquaintance homicides is the most common type of homicide um, in Australia, remembering that acquaintance homicides includes any kind of friend or acquaintance relationship um, between the victim and offender. So it's a very large category of homicide type. And they make up a quarter of all homicide incidents where we know what the victim and offender relationship was. Male-on-male -male stranger homicides is the third most common scenario in Australia and more or less replicated over the years and accounted for around 10% of incidents in 1718. Male-on-female homicide incidents comprise 30% of incidents and almost exclusively are intimate partner homicides. Male-on-female intimate partner homicide is the second most common scenario in Australia after male-on-male -male acquaintance homicides. The other categories uh, depending on the male to female uh, offender uh, victim re relationship are much less common. There's a lot of focus on filicide in Australia, largely related to, to, to family and, and domestic violence. And uh, a couple of years ago, um, the AIC uh, worked uh, with Monash University to look at filicide and filicide offending. There were seven filicides in Australia in 2017-18, in but the number of filicides varies each year. It's gone up to 28, um, um, but usually it's in, in that 10 to, to 20 incident number um, across the years. Filicides are predominantly the murder or the manslaughter of a child under 18, but we do have adult filicide victims um, from, from year to year as well. And often in those cases, they might be what you could consider mercy killings, um, where, where the adult child um, has a, a disability or a mental illness. Filicide is also a form of homicide where female offending rates are relatively equivalent to male offending rates. It does depend a little bit on the custodial relationship. You are seeing fairly equal rates of offending when it's custodial effectively biological parents who have killed their child, um, less so when we're looking at non-custodial step, step parents where it is, is, is largely male offenders. Um, and uh, as I said, males were the predominant offender where children were killed by a non-custodial parent or step parent. Um, another form of homicide that's received a lot of attention and, 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 and largely because of um, some very high profile incidents that, are, that have occurred in Victoria is male and female stranger homicide. These are uncommon events, about seven occur each year. Um, but interestingly, about two thirds of those when there is a male perpetrator and a female victim are preceded by another crime. Now homicides that have preceded another crime have waxed away over the years. Um, it can be anywhere between 10 and 20% uh, where a crime precipitated the homicide event occurring. But what's interesting with, with um, male and female stranger homicides, we are seeing a larger proportion um, preceded by another crime, and 42% of them, they were preceded by a sexual assault. In 2017-18, there were 26 Indigenous victims of homicide, around 30% of all victims recorded in that year. Indigenous victimisation rates and Indigenous offending rates are much higher than non-offending uh, victimisation rates. The male Indigenous victimisation rate in 2017-18 was four times the rate for non-Indigenous males and for females it was five times the rate for non-Indigenous females. As mentioned previously, most victims and offenders uh, know each other. And that's particularly true when we look um, at Indigenous homicide. 92% of Indigenous homicide victims knew the offender compared with 72% of non-Indigenous victims. Indigenous victims are also more frequently killed by an intimate partner or a family member than non-Indigenous people. In 1718, all but one of the nine Indigenous female victims was killed by her intimate partner. Among non-Indigenous women, just under half were killed by an intimate partner and 11 by another relative. So while females, regardless of indig Indigenous status, are mostly victims of domestic homicide, rates of victimisation are greater for Indigenous women. And when we look at men, 11 of the 17 Indigenous male victims 
were killed by a relative or an intimate partner. Most non-Indigenous males are killed by a friend or an acquaintance followed by an intimate partner. We also looked at um, uh, the relationship, Indigenous status relationship um, between victims and offenders. And of the 167 incidents where we did have Indigenous status information and gender information about victim and offender, 81% involved a non-Indigenous victim and offender. Of the 32 incidents that involved an Indigenous primary offender and or victim, the largest number involved um, an Indigenous offender and victim. So for the most part, where we have homicide incidents um, and comparing Indigenous versus non-Indigenous, you are seeing a larger proportion where there is an Indigenous victim or offender, um, they are being killed by an Indigenous person, and similarly when we're looking at non-Indigenous, a non-Indigenous victim is largely killed by a non-Indigenous offender. Finally, we'll just talk about motivation or motives for homicide and also some of the criminal history or, or, or pre-offending history of, of um, homicide offenders. Um, as mentioned, the motivation for why someone kills another person is arguably unknowable and um, each year the motive for a sizeable number of incidents is not apparent or unknown. In 2017-18, this was the case for 41% of homicide incidents recorded by State and Territory Police. But as alluded to earlier, those where we do know a motive, um, most are preceded by an argument. These are arguments that are exacerbated by the use of alcohol and illicit drugs, alcohols of a domestic nature, or spontaneous or long-term long disputes of unspecified source, context or nature. Arguments of an unspecified nature uh, precede around 30% of acquaintance homicides and a quarter of a stranger homicides. An argument about a domestic matter or an unspecified uh, nature preceded 31% of domestic homicides. So as we can see across three different homicide types, most of them, or a large, the largest proportion of them, were preceded by an argument. Desertion or termination is an off-sited reason um, for, um, or risk factor um, for uh, intimate partner homicide. And 12% of domestic homicides, which are intimate partner homicides, follow the desertion or termination of a relationship by an intimate partner. And then, then we have incidents whereby the offender was experiencing a mental illness um, at the time that the offence was, was committed. We do in, uh, uh, record information around uh, the mental illness of the offender that's provided by police. Um, but uh, those numbers do change a lot um, over the course of the years. They've largely increased um, over the 30 years, the, the number of offenders. Um, that are recorded as having a mental illness. But we tend to try to look at sentencing remarks to get a better se sense of whether mental illness did play a part um, in the commission of that offence. But certainly at the stage where we received the data from the police, um, police recorded the offender as apparently delusional in seven incidents or 4% of incidents. Um, and, um, and, but we also believe that some of those incidents, incidents where no apparent motive was recorded may also reflect um, some matters where the offender was experiencing a psychotic event or other mental disorder. And finally um, is around um, uh, criminal uh, offending. Most offenders, uh, or larger proportion of offenders, um, and, um, and actually quite a, a large proportion of victims have a previous criminal history. So in 1718, 45% of male offenders and 51% of female offenders had a previous criminal history, uh, mostly for assault, uh, and that's across both male and, and, and female offenders. When we look at uh, male offending histories, um, they're a little bit more um, varied. You have high proportions of sexual assault. Some have been previously convicted of homicide. Um, but when we look at female offenders, when it's not assault, it's largely drug matters um, or property offending. In recent years, we've started to ask about um, previous um, um, histories of domestic violence. We, haven't, we have collated this information um, for most of the 30 years of the NHMP, um, but it's been a little bit vague in the past because it's about whether that person had history either as an offender 
or the victim of domestic violence uh, and not necessarily with, um, um, with, with the partner that, um, that, 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 um, or the person that they had a relationship with. So what we've done in more recent years is we want to know whether the offender themselves had a history of domestic violence perpetration. Either they were convicted for assault, they've had an order taken out against them, or a matter has been reported to police. And what we found is that 19% of male offenders and 29% of female offenders had a known history of domestic violence. And of the 34 male offenders with a known history of domestic violence, 13 killed an intimate partner and 11 killed an acquaintance. And of the remainder, it was, it was family members. Among the 10 female offenders with a previous history of domestic violence, six killed an intimate partner, one killed another family member, and three killed an acquaintance. So what we can see here is that you are seeing those who have a known history of domestic violence going on to kill an intimate partner or family member, but some are actually killing other uh, members of, of society. Um, and with them, um, as we collate this data over the next couple of years, we hope to get um, a, a, a better sense of, of how that domestic violence history plays out in the perpetration of homicide more generally. So that concludes um, today's um, present presentation. Uh, we have two reports uh, that are being released on May the 5th, looking at data from 16, 17 and 17, 18. Some of the findings which are presented today are, are shown in, in those reports. Uh, we hope to have the 18, 19 report ready by the end of, of, of next year. Um, but uh, sorry, the end of this year, not end of next year. Um, and um, and what, what we hope to do is be able to, to, to continue uh, demonstrating that homicide on the decrease and in particular um, contribute really important information around family domestic violence and family domestic homicide. Thank you for today.